Welcome everyone to our Friday COVID Convo uh, engagement session. We're pleased to, to have you here with us and as we continue to share uh, updates on what's happening across the state of Minnesota with regards to K-12 schools. And again, uh, the, the case studies with three different districts to share how things have, uh, have gone on the first week of school. And in the, the case of Bemidji, uh, just starting on uh, next week with regards to the school. So, uh, with that, let's turn to our agenda. The next slide, please. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the start of school, and and you know we have normal jitters at the beginning of any school year, and obviously this year is different. Uh, and so we're gonna get a sense of what kind of jitters are are we seeing out there, and how are we handling those? Uh, what are what what do we what have we learned from the first week of school from uh, you know a few of these districts uh, and their experiences. And then talk about what are we hearing different from uh, Neil Carlson with regards to the uh, different studies uh, medically and others across the state. And then uh, again, talking about communication. How do we continue to communicate? You're gonna see all the districts talking about consistent messaging as being one of the most important things that they're seeing uh, right now across their districts. And then we'll open it up uh, for, for Q&A. Uh, again, for those that are maybe are new to our calls on our, our COVID calls, uh, feel free to use the chat function and, and put your questions out either to specific districts or to any of the panelists here. Uh, and again, we'll take some time to answer your questions uh, and, and provide that feedback. Uh, again, encourage everyone to come to the website. We continue to update things. Uh, Fred Nolan continues to update his blog on the latest things that we are hearing from the Department of Health or Department of Education and, and so on. So with that, I'm just gonna introduce uh, Fred Nolan and uh, let's get started. Brad. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, with the first week of school, I know I always used to get nightmares uh, the night before school opened as a teacher and principal and still had one, uh, you know, over the weekend. So um, we all get concerned, but this is uh, in COVID-19. And so um, districts are taking extraordinary steps. And so we'd like to know what they're doing and what you're doing uh, to make, keep everyone calm. There's also a high concern that we're not going to see the students that we projected last spring. And last spring, they were attending your school, they were enrolled, and so the department was able to extend that enrollment and keep you whole through the end of the year. They made it very clear there's nothing that they can do uh, without going to the legislature that would keep you whole if you can't get the students enrolled in the first place. And so what has become enrollment melt is the concept that kids aren't coming back as you expected. And all superintendents who are registered for this uh, call, uh, check your email, you would have gotten an email just a minute or so ago or coming right up uh, with this spreadsheet at the bottom. Um, it should work where you put your projected enrollment in the first column, your hybrid or in person when you actually, in person means actually showed up or hybrid they actually showed up and distance means they actually logged in um, because then you can start counting them as being enrolled. Uh, that'll give you your total actual enrollment, your melt and your percentage. Um, we'll have to see what happens across the state. Um, we've heard that the Northwest Service Co-op is collecting this for their region, would encourage all the service co-ops to do this and then be in touch with your advocacy organizations, MREA, AMSD, C and MSBA uh, because when the legislature begins in January, uh, there may be some steps that need to be taken. Because um, otherwise you're looking at simply the enrollment declining number, uh, which you get one quarter of the loss from the previous year, uh, which could be considerable in some districts, but we're hoping not. And so we'll hear from the districts uh, that have enrolled and Bemidji that's thinking about it, where they are and what they're doing to limit that en enrollment melt. So everyone, if you could help out and we'd get more than just three districts at a little bigger, bigger base, um, the email will be in that ICS uh, logo there. And the green thing is a download the spreadsheet and, and plug your numbers in as you're listening. So welcome and we'll turn it over to Dan Voce and Mora. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Voce. I'm the superintendent here at Mora Public Schools and um, Interesting enough, this is my first year as being a superintendent, so I am uh, learning by fire here this year, and it's, it's certainly been an interesting and exciting time 
to be a superintendent. And uh, one of the things that I'm trying to wrap my arms around is the enrollment piece, like Fred said, is um, where are we at being in a new district? Um, I'm, I'm trying to gather some history behind our enrollment. And one of the things that um, I'd like to do moving forward is get more of a five-year history or 10-year history of where we've been with our numbers. But with that being said, you can see that our projected enrollment, I just took our last year's enrollment and um, plugged in some numbers for our, for our hybrid model and for our distance learning. And our total enrollment um, is down a bit at the elementary school. And, um, and so that is, uh, where we're at, and, and I haven't had an opportunity really to dig in too deep with uh, the principles on this, but that's one of the things on my, my agenda here. For the secondary school, we seem to be up um, eight students, which is a good sign. I think that, uh, interesting enough, uh, for our distance learning, we call it the family flex. I believe we only had five seniors out of our entire senior class opt for family flex. So a lot of the kids really want to be back in school with their peers. And so that's been really interesting. Um, and so total, we're down just a little bit, which is encouraging. Um, however, you know, minus 22 times the, the um, average daily membership and, and how much you get per student is, is a pretty big hit in a in any district. So we're gonna really work hard to dig deeper into who are these families that are not enrolled? Why aren't they enrolled? Do they still live where they did before? Um, interesting enough, our homeschool numbers are down from last year. Um, so um, if we haven't received all of those homeschool things yet, um, so we, we just need to dig into the data a little bit. But um, one of the things that we've really focused on with our admin team is, we, we want to show families that and our, and our community that students are coming to school and they are learning um, while at the same time we're providing a safe learning environment for them. So we've done a lot of communication through that. These jitters, um, and I guess what I saw is a lot of excitement from the students and I was really excited to come to school. The first day and, and be able to see our students and be able to see our families drop off their kids. I know the kindergarten uh, parents always want to walk their kids to their classroom on that first day. So that was a little bit different, but just trying to instill that confidence within our team has been a big part of um, my messaging and our messaging with our principals is here. We're going to he be here to support our staff. And with the families, we're, we're here to help you and help your students come to school, learn, be safe. And our plan, I believe, from the beginning was a real solid return to school plan, very intensive. We communicated that extensively with our staff and with our uh, families. And um, certainly trying to instill that engineering mindset and I, I, I'm not sure where I heard this but I, I believe a few other superintendents that we were talking and usually in education you get to try something for a few months or a year well this year we get to try it for a few days or a week before we change things so um, just getting that engineering mindset within our within our staff um, and students are unbelievable they um, they were ready to come back and they were ready to follow the rules. They were respectful and responsible in every way, shape, or form so far. I know it's maybe the honeymoon phase yet, but um, the other thing that we've really tried to do to calm jitters is just keep messaging and uh, sharing videos, sharing social media photos that these are some things that um, students are doing. You can see a couple of the pictures there. Um, that we've shared uh, over social media. And exciting and hopeful, I guess, I'm really trying to focus on keeping our, our staff and our uh, community and our families hopeful. I like that word. Um, and that um, together we can work together and our students are shining, our staff are stepping up. Um, bus drivers have been amazing. They're doing double runs. 
Um, I should have maybe mentioned that we're in a hybrid at the high school and we're in person at the elementary. Um, our, our food service people have been phenomenal. Think about all the adjustments that they've had to make. Our secretaries um, have just stepped up to do whatever and however and whenever we need their help. Um, and teachers and admin, everybody's been stepping up to the plate and doing their part and that makes the superintendent's job a lot easier and uh, very proud of the team that, that we've put together. Um, some of the students and parents, they're, they're really adjusting to being in this new environment and, um, and they seem to be taking it in stride. And uh, the parents, I believe, have been really gracious to our schools and giving us um, some slack that maybe we wouldn't see in the past. Um, but they've been really understanding and appreciative that we have school and that we're doing our best to keep people safe. Even though things are different, we're trying to convey that message that, hey, we're still, we're still going to be in school and students are going to be learning. And uh, I guess a couple other things that have been maybe some things that we're working through and we're not quite used to yet is the new decision tree guidelines from MDH. Um, we're, we're running through some, some situations where staff are having to take a few days off because maybe their children are having uh, one symptom. And so we've been working closely with Connecticut County Public Health and asking them questions um, because staff really are wanting to be at school. So we're trying to work through some of those situations where um, people want to be here, but they, they shouldn't be here. Um, and then just keep on um, keeping track, I guess, of what students and staff and families need to know and understand to be safe and healthy and to make sure that their kids are being safe and healthy here. Um, the masking and the distancing and the hand washing and sanitizing seems to be normal practice and, and maybe all of the summer months that we've had and all of the uh, news and media has been a positive uh, for our students and our families because masking has not been an issue here at our school. Kids showed up the first day and, and uh, they, they seem to be going um, and doing exactly what uh, we're expecting in normal everyday society. So that's what we have here at Mora Public Schools. And again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here. If you have any questions or I can be of help, um, please reach out to me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Almos, and I'm the superintendent of schools in East Central. Um, yes, calming uh, beginning of the year jitters. We have enough of that to do on a normal year, um, but this year it's uh, it's much worse. As 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 Fred said, uh, I too have those dreams on the way back to school. Um, I most of the time before school starts, the night before is a sleepless night. So uh, I think this year was even more so. Um, Really when it comes to the jitters, I think first and foremost, I should mention that our current case rate data is 8.58. And next week, uh, our, our local public health is predicting our number to go to 9.3. So not only do we have back to school jitters, we also have the, uh, we have a lot of people watching that number like a hawk. Um, when we tip over 10, what's our plan? So much of what I'm gonna talk about here relates to um, now we're going back, as Dan said, working the plan because we may have to make a change coming up. But when it comes to calming jitters, the first thing I think was probably the most important is to work with our staff. Um, when it comes to staff, uh, you know, I've thrown in here that we've scheduled regular meetings with our union leadership. I have another one coming up Monday afternoon. Uh, at that meeting, I want to talk to them about our transition planning. We're going to go back to our plans together and say, if we have to make a change, what is it, what's it going to look like? What's our timeline? What's our plan? I'm going to ask them, too, for uh, help communicating on that decision tree everybody's work getting so good at uh, looking at, making sure that their membership, too, knows what that is, so that when we do uh, work with kids or families or staff, they know it, it isn't just us deciding. It's coming from this decision tree. And much of what our, our plan with the union on Monday is just to check in. Uh, do we have enough PPE? Are people feeling okay? Um, you know, I know we can't answer all concerns, but do we have the majority of them answered? 
are there new questions after one week of trying all this that we need to really go after? And really, is there anything that we didn't think through? Because now we've had just a little bit of a test run. So we want to talk to them about that. Uh, I want to check in too, not only with the union, but with our staff about their mental health needs. Um, you know, we were a district that provided on-site uh, therapy for staff uh, on their prep periods. And that, has, that is continuing. So I want to check and see how our staff are doing with that. Um, you, know, you know, the work that goes into uh, trauma-informed schools and those kind of things talks a lot about secondary trauma and staff members. And so we've made that commitment to do that. And I think we need to go back to that and, and check in with our staff. Um, in, in our both of our buildings, we've brought in uh, what we're calling floating subs. Um, right now, it's one in each building. And we've basically told the, the sub in each building, come here every single day, and we'll, we'll direct the work depending on where we are that day. And that's really been a big hit. Um, a staff person that could say, hey, I'll take your kids for a walk. Uh, I'll, I'll bring them down to Phi Ed so that you can have a mask break. Uh, take your mask off, get a drink of coffee, take a walk. Um, that's been kind of a big hit. So we're going to continue that and we may end up bringing in more subs to try to help support staff um, with that. Um, regular check-ins with our higher risk staff. Our principals are really good about keeping those relationships close and, and of course confidential. But circling back and saying, how'd the first week go? Are your students spaced enough? Do you have enough PPE? Because we know that you're taking a risk coming here and we are, we're appreciative of you being here but are you feeling comfortable after four days of doing this? Moving on to our students and families, uh, I think we have to reassure them, uh, like Dan said, our masking has gone very well. I checked in with our bus drivers and we really had one kid on a bus that we've had to have a parent meeting with, talk through what this, you know, what masking is all about, but really in the grand scheme of things, one kid, um, you know, that's really pretty amazing. And so a big shout out to our staff for, for making this a priority. Uh, if you remember last week, we talked about the video and, and the, through our PBIS uh, intervention to talk about masking and why we do what we do. And we think it's paid off because um, it's really a big deal. I, I still get questions from the community this week. You know, can our kids really do this? And I just keep saying, the kids can do it. I'm more worried about the adults. Um, and it seems to be working okay. With students and families, uh, you know, communication is, everybody knows that, it's key to it all, regular updates. And really, I think it comes down to answering that question right here, right now, is how are things going? Going back to, it's going really well, and building confidence and, uh, and that positivity. Um, I put this in here when it comes to calming jitters, because um, we've had a couple of uh, issues pop up. Um, we are working to remind our students and our families that if they have a concern, they should get tested. And also, they should participate in contact tracing. So a situation, for example, where a father that had no contact with our school tests positive for COVID. The kid, right before school starts, uh, started having similar symptoms. But the dad said, well, you don't need to get tested because I know that you have it. It's the same symptoms I have. You know, that's probably a true statement. But the reality is public health wants them to get tested so we can go through contact tracing and make sure we're keeping the rest of our school system safe. So we're trying to make sure when we call them jitters that we remind people that we need you to do this because it helps our school and it helps us all be safe. Um, calming jitters with our building leaders. I have some new department leaders um, and so making sure that we support the message and help them with the message that masks are required, we have to social distance, our, our hand washing procedures need to be in place. But I think the backbone is, uh, you know, even comes from the top here to be able to say that we support these new leaders. Because as many of us on this call know, being a new leader is difficult enough, but then thrown into a situation like this, uh, they're going to need some support. Uh, making sure our leaders know what our timelines are for transition and are we ready to change models. That's where we are right today. Are we ready to change models because our data is going to get there. And I put this in here today because this came up yesterday. Um, our school board members have been very supportive of us, but they, they were asking me for messaging on what, what has our school done to keep students and staff safe. So I've provided them with the list of purchases we've used our, our uh, CRF money for, and also, uh, you know, really some, some sound bites to be able to go tell people, here's what we're doing to keep people safe. You know, they're elected to represent the community and they're, gonna, they're the folks that are gonna get the questions around town 
um, about school. And so we need to arm them with that, with those messages. And Andy, can I, that's all great, great. Can I back you up to your um, on staff mental health support? Who yep. provides that? We have a question in the chat window and how do you pay for that? That's, that's quite, um, quite a good thing and not every district is doing that. Yeah, so we have a contract with two different mental health organizations in our school, and they have, they have agreed to do that for our staff. Uh, it's, it's mostly on Fridays. That's how it started. Fridays would be staff day, so they could come on their prep period, but they've opened that up even further um, to doing it where they can fit it in around the kids, of course. Um, how, how do we pay for it? That's billed through insurance. Uh, for our staff members. So they, they have to go through that process as well, just like they would anywhere else if they were leaving our system. But what we found is that our teachers needed it, right? They wanted to leave on their prep period, probably take their sick leave. It would be a minimum of a half day to go do that. Instead, we said, let's build that in-house so it can be one hour and maybe do it on their prep, or if they need an hour of sick leave, we, we allow them to do that. But um, that's been a big hit, and, a, and I think a way that we've kept even some of those newer teachers, um, you know, the data shows quickly that the first five years you lose those teachers, but if we can support their mental health through this too, we think that we can maybe hold on to some of them too. Excellent, thank you for that information. Yeah, so what's next for East Central? Uh, we have to watch the numbers closely. Uh, I can't, I just can't say enough, this partnership with Pine County Public Health, they're doing an excellent job of supporting the Pine County schools. Um, what we're going to have to potentially answer, depending on where the number goes, is can we ride out a number that's over 10 for one week? If that number is 10 and a half or 11, do we want to ride it out for a week and see if it drops again? So um, I, we're very fortunate in Pine County to have a very collaborative spirit with our neighboring schools. And what we want to do is to try to make that decision together. If we're going to make a change, can all, of, can all four school districts in our county decide to go together? Because if it does tip over 10 and we don't make a change, we have to answer for why we're going to do that. And so that's, uh, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, with transition planning, um, I have to have a shout out to Dan Bochi and Mora. We've, uh, he was not kind enough to share his transition uh, plan and lay it, laying out steps to communicate. Uh, if we do make a change, uh, what does this look like? And I've shared that with quite a few teachers and our union leaders, and it seems to have kind of put people at, at ease a little bit with what that process would look like. So a big thank you to Dan there. Um, communication. Um, as, I, as I said, we're going to try to make this decision together as Pine County Schools. I linked in here a video that Pine County Public Health did uh, for students, uh, for, for families and for staff, uh, kind of going through the, the guidance and the decision tree and when to stay home, when to quarantine, what does that really mean? So hopefully the link works there when we share this presentation out. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me as well. And again, uh, what's next for us is continue to manage the questions. Every single day we get questions. Uh, this father's come down with COVID or this mother's uh, is, uh, potentially has it. What do we do now? And so as Dan said, we have to work the plan, right? Uh, be proficient with that decision tree. Have that stuck up on the bulletin board right by our desk so we can step through it and be ready to answer those questions. Here's where our enroll, uh, enrollment numbers fall uh, when it comes to enrollment melt. Um, we actually had, saw just a little increase in our K through six enrollment. We're up 11 students. Um, so we haven't experienced a melt in enrollment in the elementary. Our seven through 12 enrollment is down 12 students. Um, we, at the beginning of there where it says projected enrollment, you'll see 725. That's the number we are budgeting for and we're currently at 724. So we're pretty close to where we thought we would come out. It's worth noting that our, um, that our uh, what we finished the year was, was 752. And we know that as those numbers fluctuate with graduates going out, kindergartners coming in, um, but really we finished the year last year higher and took a pretty conservative approach to starting the year. And you can see we're coming out kind of right where we thought we would. So what we're going to try to do to prevent enrollment melt, um, again, we're not seeing a lot of it, but there is some kids that we have to track down and find out what they're doing. We have some kids that have enrolled elsewhere, and we have a small number that we're just unsure about still. 
So um, here's a few things we're trying to do to, you know, kind of work through that. Um, first and foremost, this is a bigger picture, but that conservative budgeting uh, seems to be helping us. Um, I have principals that a few years ago that decided that we should probably get out to the students' homes and find out, you know, what's going on with kids at home. And that is really paying off this year when we're trying to find those kids. Our principals aren't bashful about jumping in the car and going to find them. Having a meeting on the front lawn, uh, distanced of course with masks to say, hey, what's going on with school? We haven't seen you. Did you enroll in a neighboring district or online or where are you? Um, and they're working through that right now as they're, as they're starting, starting the school year. Focus and lean on those relationships. Uh, seek out our families, welcome them, reassure them that we're, we're doing things as safely as we can. Um, I, I, I just put this one in here today with attendance and truancy. Um, we had a meeting today with our, with our county level leaders, uh, including one of our local judges to talk about what does attendance and truancy look like uh, in, a, in, a, in a COVID era. Um, so we, as, as our local schools, we're gonna add much more of a focus on equity considerations when it comes to truancy. If a student doesn't have internet access, uh, how are we gonna help them to try to be enrolled in school so we can track them down so they don't end up with a truancy issue? And hopefully that means that they'll see the school system as a place that's trying to support them and maybe keep them from enrolling elsewhere. Communicate with and welcome students back from distance learning. We're small enough to be able to say, hey, if you tried distance learning and it, it really wasn't, well, wasn't, didn't work for you, then come on back. You can come back next Monday and let's get you enrolled back in in-person learning. Um, of course, depending on how you've uh, socially distanced and wore your mask and those kind of things, we have to work through that. But we are going to welcome them back to help our enrollment melt. Stay in touch with our homeschool families. We're, we're you know, as a, as a local public school, we've been a little hand, hands off with our homeschool families in the past. But this COVID-19 uh, situation um, has reminded us that I think we probably need to keep in close touch with them. Ask them what kind of support do they need? Can we be their source of support? So if they decide homeschool wasn't for them when we're all done, that they come back to us and want to enroll. Maintain trust and build confidence, I think is key. Um, we, we are fortunate to have a high, uh, you know, a community that trusts their school system right now and we wanna make sure we maintain that. And that happens through communication and, and helping them feel good and build confidence in our school system. And I just put there that I think it's, I think PR and word of mouth is the best way we can do that. If our reputation is that we're prepared and we communicate well, that's the best thing that we can have spreading in our community and to try to keep the kids enrolled in our school. And focusing on the future, communicating that school's gonna look different post COVID. You know, is distance learning gonna be an option for kids even after we're done you know, and we get through this pandemic? And so if there's, if there's families out there trying to figure out if distance learning is gonna be a long-term solution for them, we need to make sure we're thinking that through so we don't have enrollment melt happening for years to come. And so um, those are the things we're trying to do to prevent our enrollment from slipping. Um, and I appreciate Fred's comments about the legislature and, and making sure that we advocate and talk this issue through them with them because uh, it's gonna be a problem, I suspect. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tim Lutz, the superintendent of Bemidji Area Schools. Thank you, Dan and Andrew, for all of your detailed information. I will probably not have quite as much to share today because Bemidji Schools has not started school yet. We are starting on Monday. We delayed the start of school by one week so that we can do some additional work to get ready for school. Uh, we are a hybrid at the high school and all in at the elementary school setting and K through five are all in. So here are our numbers that I can share with you. And uh, we're not, too terribly bad with the slip or the melt when it comes to the elementary schools. And even though it says K-6 there, we consider elementary K-5 because we have a middle school that's part of the secondary. So you can see the numbers there, we're down 114, which is not all that bad. I expected it to be worse earlier. So just shy of 4% of a melt, a bit, quite a bit higher at the secondary level. Now this is Still largely conjecture. I'll have much more solid numbers next week once we have students starting in our buildings. But it's looking like over 25% as a melt. And that kind of makes sense because a lot of our secondary students do have more options. And we've lost a lot of our students 
to either homeschooling at the secondary level or online homeschooling. And that's where the largest part of it is. Every day I receive two or three notices from families, either elementary or high school about some dropping, going to online or to other sites. Um, so a total of about 12% across the district. And a big part of that also is our Native American population from Leech Lake and Red Lake. And a lot of those students have not let us know yet what their plans are. The great majority of our students from those areas are opting for distance learning full time. But many of them have not yet reached out to us. So they're still off our radar, so to speak. And we're waiting, we're reaching out to them. Our Indian Ed Liaison and Indian Education team is spending a lot of time reaching out to those families. And when we get our solid numbers next week to see who's not in our buildings, we will be checking on those families to make sure they're at least in the distance learning situation. We have, as of yesterday, 802 students in distance learning. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that is a very large and still growing school within a school for us. Calming the jitters for us is all about creating confidence. And I've been saying that over the course of the summer, we need to create confidence amongst our staff and amongst their parents and students. It's an interesting situation here in Bemidji. It's a very conservative community. And we have people all over the spectrum from parents and even a few staff members who have expressed grave concerns about their lives by having school during the pandemic. And then we have families and parents and staff members who still think this is a hoax. I talked to one parent yesterday who thinks that the CDC and the media are just perpetrating a huge hoax and that uh, uh, we just, just should be all in school. And so it's very challenging reaching out to some of these outliers and, and I'm pretty much realizing we're not going to change their minds, but for those in the middle who have common sense, we're trying to instill a sense of confidence by showing them that this is real, but we've got this. It's all about messaging. We're doing a lot of messaging now this week about student screening and continuing to message about masking. And we've had a lot of open houses and orientations this week. And during those sessions, we're able to remind people and kind of gauge how the masking is going. And that piece has been going very well. And we're seeing people showing up with masks. I did hear a rumor last week, that there's a group of parents who will be sending their kids without masks to the high school. And so we're readying ourselves for that scenario, but I don't think it'll be that bad. It's a simple uh, way of just messaging families. It's just like you don't smoke in our schools, just don't, like you don't light up in a restaurant, just like you should be wearing a seatbelt. It's your choice to do so or not if you're on your own, but it's a mandate, it's a law, a statute. And when you're coming to school, we ask you to wear a mask. Constant communication through the various media and social media outlets. I've been on the radio twice today. I'll be meeting with uh, a TV reporter this afternoon, again, to remind people how we, what we're doing, first of all, to make sure we're starting schools safely and the constant reminder about social distancing and wearing of masks. Email messages as well are going out constantly. It's all about building relationships with families I have our principals this week. They have been reaching out doing town hall meetings with parents so that parents can continue to ask questions about what we're doing and how we're doing it and what school is going to look like when we start next week. And that's been an important opportunity for parents just to, to ask these questions and for principals to be able to instill this sense of confidence that we've got this. Lunch will look different, music will look different, busing will look different. Classrooms will look different, but we've got this. We're also sending strong messaging about the creation of cohorts within our buildings. We're working very hard to make sure that in all of our buildings, our classrooms, our pods, and our houses are remaining as cohorts as much as possible, even with larger classes like music. Number one, to prevent the spread of COVID. But secondly, if we do have an outbreak, with these cohorts, it'll be much more simple, much more efficient to go back and contact Trace and say with certainty that this student was not in contact with that student 
in a different house or pod or grade. Um, we're limiting outside groups even from coming in, even the TV reporter who wants to do a story and the newspaper reporter on Monday back to school, we're asking them to stay outside. And we're making sure we don't do much cohort mixing or much traveling of staff in between buildings. For our building leaders, again, consistent messaging of those three areas. And also, especially in the secondary, we've had a lot of concern raised, concerns raised about when we have changes in classes. So at the high school, we're on a block schedule, about 88 minutes a class, and we have seven minutes of passing time in between. Para, uh, teachers are very concerned about the new group coming in after the new old group was just there for, for almost 90 minutes, and how do we clean desks? And it is the teachers who have asked for some cleaning supplies, gloves, and some rags and we are providing them and we provided, we've created a video showing teachers, those who want to, how to clean the desks in their rooms in five minutes with morning mist and with rags and to make sure that those desks and classrooms are ready for the new group of students. And that has done a huge service in terms of creating confidence amongst our own staff. On the next slide, continuing on with the enrollment melt concept. We are working with at the elementary level and I've talked about this in previous sessions with our distance learning teams to be able to support those students and families. For us, one of the biggest concerns is making sure we keep our students who are on distance learning full time engaged. And so we've created a distance learning team for the elementary, the K through five classes and grades that is going well, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that works next week. We have done something different as of last week. We have, we've met with the secondary teachers because we found out that it's just not possible to create a distance learning team for many of our secondary classes. Because it's one thing to pull a couple of third grade teachers or kindergarten teachers for a distance learning team. But we only have one high school college calculus or trigonometry teacher that teacher can't be on both teams, if you will. So at the secondary level, we're seeing that rather than asking these teachers to teach with one prep a day, one prep hour, to teach those students who are in their class during the week for the hybrid model, as well as those students who are home that week for the hybrid model, plus all of the students, we have close to 400 in secondary who are full-time distance learning students, those teachers just do not have the time and therefore they don't, they don't have the capacity to really do justice to the distance learning students. So we have scrambled and put together what we are calling a distance learning student support day every Wednesday during the duration of hybrid where students will stay home. It's still a learning day, they'll still have homework, but we wanna focus on making sure our teachers can spend that day reaching out to those full-time distance learning students, as well as those hybrid students who are gone for the week to make sure we're dealing with the issues, the concerns, and the engagement levels of those students and the concerns of the parents. One of our biggest concerns is not having students drop off our radar during the time that we're in hybrid learning and not losing those students. Because if we lose them, they may not come back when we get back to all in, if that's ever possible. It's important to continue offering parents the choice and the flexibility and the communication as we continue to serve them because we want to make sure that they do come back when we're done with this pandemic or when we can have students in our buildings. Right now, even though we're in the hybrid model, our county numbers have gone down to 9.54 according to the MDH. So that means we could be all in if we wanted to be. Our local county numbers, which are more current and up to the date as of yesterday, show that our numbers are at 6.51. So we're really dropping. However, they were at 6. Point, they were 6.07 yesterday. So we might now be seeing a slight rise after Labor Day. I anticipated this, that we might be going up a little bit five or six or seven days after Labor Day. So we could see a swing back up again beyond 10. So we're not gonna jump right into all in at the secondary level. We're going to wait a few weeks 
and see if those numbers stay steady at the low 10. So again, with the fourth bullet, confidence in our district efforts, communications, updates, and constant flow of information. We have chosen as a district to go with the summer food program because of its flexibility in menus and the opportunity to provide curbside pickup and some delivery for families. And we see that as an ongoing important service to our families so that we can keep them connected and keep them engaged. And also with the referendum operating levy coming up, we wanna make sure families not only don't, you know, that they don't drop off our radar, but they continue to see the important services that our schools can provide, both in terms of building confidence related to the pandemic, but also in terms of the other services that we provide. Continuing on with the next slide, we are working on developing equity teams uh, in two different areas. One is with Indian education, and we're focusing many of our students from Red Lake and Cass Lake are opting for distance learning because those school districts are, Red Lake is all distance learning right now, and Cass Lake is largely distance learning. And so many of those students are opting for distance learning within our district as well. And it's very important that we maintain contact with them and provide the equitable educational opportunities for those students. So we're working on not only really ramping up our distance learning supports for them and outreach for them, but our Indian education liaison and her team are working on creating vid uh, videos and virtual programming above and beyond the school day with cultural activities, cultural foods and how to cook them, uh, cultural, cultural roundhouse dancing and other opportunities for students to stay culturally connected and to have the mental health and emotional support that they need so they don't drop off the radar. We're doing the same thing with our special education team, providing equity, making sure we're focusing on the unique needs of each student on an IEP. And finally, we're focusing on resilience and collaboration. We're reaching out to the entire community within our student community, our staff community, parent community, reminding them that we need resilience because the landscape is constantly changing and shifting under our feet. We will get through this year and we'll make this year great if we continue to work together and show patience and graciousness to each other and resilience. Well, now, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Team. And before Neil gets started, um, you know, best of luck next week and hopefully a number of those uh, 500 high school kids actually show up at your door or log online. We did have a question that you may be able to investigate for next week. Of the high school students, the question was how many are opting for PSEO? I didn't hear you say that, heard you say you don't know and you're getting quite a few requests for homeschooling. But as you, as you granularly look at that for next Friday, could you pull out what ha what's happening in PSEO? I know that's a concern of many high school principals that kids are gonna opt for PSEO because it's online. And so um, I think that's something uh, to, to look for next week. And also um, I think with Andy, with your numbers that were down 12 or I can't remember which one, um, and just be curious to see, are we seeing a trend to PSEO or not? Well, Neil, you've got some great information I know from our pre-conversation, so go ahead. Yeah, we've got a couple of things that we've been following at the at the U. Uh, number one, there's a a PP update that we've been working on. Uh, there's been some discussion about whether face shields are an appropriate uh, switch out for uh, cloth face coverings, and the data is in, and they are not very good at all. So I would not use the uh, face shield alone as a, an appropriate accommodation. We've come up with some other uh, possible accommodations that we've been using for individuals that have had uh, concerns and that involves using a, uh, let's say a, a mini PAPR, or nano PPA, PAPR and hooking that up to like a, a KN95. And that's been a good accommodation for some individuals who have difficulty breathing and, and having problems with the uh, current uh, face shields. And I can provide some more information off, offline on that if people are interested. The second one has been uh, teacher communication. And I think both Andrew and Tim really hit on it <clears throat> well on their discussion. Uh, Tim was discussing about the fact that you have a person that 
is trying to teach calculus and it's impossible for that person to do a quality job of both distance learning and online and in t in person teaching at the same time and i reached out to a uh, uh, a teacher in a small school district and i just asked can you give me daily updates of how things are going this week and one of the things that she mentioned and it goes to andrew's part is that the teachers are really stressed having to do the, in the small district they have to do both the in-person and online and they have to do it at the same time and they are frankly overwhelmed and many of the staff are that she's noticed are just crying and I think having appropriate mental health focus on that for them would be I think paramount and so I'm going to reach out to this person and see if they can get that instituted in their school district but we are asking teachers at least when they have to do both, to essentially do two jobs at one time, which is, I think, very difficult and very stressful. And working through the school district and having a good, solid communication between administration and the teachers, figuring out how can we make this work? What are some of the things that we can take away from you that are more busy work so you can focus really solidly on what you need to do to communicate and how are some other things we can do to make make this work better for you. So I think that's both uh, Tim and Ann, Andy have really focused on something that's going to be really important going forward. The last one was a restaurant risk and uh, Fred and I had a discussion about this at, before the talk. The CDC came out with a study that actually was based in Minnesota and they looked at people that came in for testing and the major difference between the people that tested positive and the people that did not test positive was the people that tested positive were two times more likely to spend time at a restaurant or a bar inside where uh, some social distancing practicing weren't, weren't very good. I think schools are doing the best job they can to create a safe environment for teaching but the responsibility outside of school dis of school district time is incredibly important we had a discussion about some individuals who they had a, a nice workshop together and then they went out to eat afterwards one of the persons was positive and it created a, <clears throat> a situation where we have a large number of people in quarantine now or isolation because of that exposure so high risk event right now is uh, eating inside at a restaurant and so if you can encourage both the students and the staff and faculty to be very thoughtful about engaging in any activities like that that are at high risk for transmitting it so that we can get through the school school year without having a, a major outbreak and having lots of people go down and making it very difficult to teach school. Thank you, Nancy. really good advice um, and good conversations with, with faculty and, and students about that for the times on the weekends when you go home uh, to keep the safety up. Todd. I have, yeah, I tried, yeah. I have one more thing just to help out yep. and that was had to do with the teacher cleaning. I think when you're looking at the chemicals used, you want to be very careful about it because some of the quaternary ammonia compounds have been doing research on it. Some of them can induce some asthmatic situations. So you want to make sure if the teachers are voluntarily doing that, that they should keep track of their symptoms and they may have to switch over to more of a hydrogen peroxide based compound or something else so that we don't induce a problem of asthma with the individuals doing the cleaning. But that's it for me. That's very good. This is so different. We don't want unintended consequences. That's that's great, great advice, Neil. Todd, are you with us? I am with us, and thanks, Fred. Um, you know, it, it's been very interesting to watch as the progression of these Friday sessions have uh, have continued, and so much of the early discussion was how to plan appropriately. And now increasingly we're hearing from the superintendents about different ways that they're communicating. It's become almost the majority of what they're reporting in to all of us. And 
And I think if, uh, you know, you may be listening to this and you may be saying, oh, I feel like I've communicated as much as a person possibly can. What else can I say? And let me just assure you that frequent, even daily communication to your most important stakeholders continues to be critical, even if it things, seems like things are calming down. If you ever want to know what to say, um, I, I'll give you a simple three-step process that you could use. The first thing you should communicate outward is what is going well. The second thing you should communicate outward is any advice you have for improvement or things that community should be watching. And the third thing is you should communicate what you think the next few weeks looks like. Um, if, if you just kind of use that as a foundation for your regular communications, I think that, that will mean a lot. And when I'm talking about that kind of communication, it's what you're sharing with particularly parents and students in the community as a whole. Um, I'm gonna try to follow that formula here really quick and tell you that what I've heard from the superintendents today in this presentation, what's going well is persistence, providing quick answers, engaging staff as often as possible, and trying to think ahead, particularly when it comes to connections with kids who might, who might not be doing as well in this process as other students are. Those four really stood out to me as, as, as important things that we're doing well in communication. If I had one suggestion for improvement, is that we always need to remember to link this back to what we're doing to help kids with learning. And that is sometimes we may fall back into a lot of explanations of this is what we're doing on COVID and, and here's what it's going to look like. Remember to still show people the impact of how kids are learning and how they're helping overcome this remarkably different barrier that they've come across here during 2020. So keep tying this back to the improvements in learning. And the final thing is, as you look at the next several weeks, I would just give you this advice. Don't slow down your communication just because it feels like things are quieting down, or maybe because you've been able to move into to all school learning or, 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 or some other, in some other way you think, wow, finally a rest. Keep the communication coming because you're always connecting with your residents when you do that. And a particular call out to those school districts that either in November or in 2021 are planning on going out for some kind of referendum. Assuming that you are, the communication you're doing right now actually means a lot more in the long run on your reputation than some of the communication maybe you've done in past years. So that's my advice, Fred. Very good, Todd. And that is so true that, that you build trust over time and, and don't just ramp it up for an election. Um, and this is, this is as critical as it's going to get in terms of communicating. Um, that's, a, that's a great formula uh, to, to use. And um, Aaron, do we have uh, questions in the chat to address? We do not, no. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to spend time that, that people have. It's uh, just a couple, couple minutes ahead of time. Any last word from any of the superintendents, uh, given Todd's formula there? Anything you want to hit that maybe you didn't hit? Or you know, I would like to mention one thing, because I didn't really have a what's next slide. But for us, what's next is really to be looking at these numbers to see if they stay steady. There's a lot of people are now saying, hey, if we're down below 10, why aren't we going into all in mode. So uh, two reasons for that, actually three. One is Labor Day. We wanna make sure, and our number just went up a little bit from yesterday, so we could be seeing a Labor Day uptick now, five or six days after Labor Day. Second reason is the President of the United States is gonna be in Bemidji next Wednesday, and I anticipate a huge crowd at the airport, and uh, therefore I would anticipate a huge uptick in our numbers about a week after that. So few things up in the air in Bemidji, but uh, those are our next steps. Very good, Tim, to, to monitor the, the environment and see what's happening out there outside of your four walls as that could affect um, school. It's good advice for all of us. Well, next week, we'll be back at the same time. We had a good turnout. I think people uh, were able to, to break free over lunch and we'll hear from Bemidji their first week and uh, from Pine, uh, Pine uh, County on what the schools are doing as their numbers may be going upwards. And um, 
I want to thank everybody for participating and um, have a good and safe weekend. Uh, there's the links. And if you've had a chance now to grab that spreadsheet, uh, feel free to return that back to Aaron. Um, so if you didn't put it in the chat, we had a couple of people put it in the chat and there wasn't really um, quite a good, there wasn't much drop off, which I, I think if that's the trend across the state, that's really good news. And it's how schools have built confidence over the summer getting ready to come back to school, either in hybrid person or distance learning. So with that, uh, for ICS and our three school districts and uh, for Neil and Todd, we bid you a good weekend and thank you.